Well, here we are, clinical case challenge. It's going to be uh, Greg and I doing this together. And this is something that we actually have on our website uh, periodically. We will send out on our list serve uh, an interesting case. And, you, you know, we, we tease people in and come in and, and, and get more explanation. We haven't done that for a while, and that's all on me. I apologize. But uh, practice and life has gotten kind of busy, and sometimes I forget to do that. But i like to get back uh, on doing that very shortly. But this is clinical case challenge, and sometimes things are not as obvious as one may think, so bear that in mind. You know, there are a number of polling questions in here. I think, Greg, we have about 12 polling questions. I've actually embraced polling questions uh, as part of the uh, presentation, not just something we have to do uh, to, for the regulatory boards, and I, I think I like to bring our, our audience in, in virtually. These are my disclosures. Uh, I've been on a few advisory boards. I think really at this point, I am right now in the last 12 months or certainly 24, 24 down to this Bausch and Loam. Uh, I've got no financial interest uh, in any product disease or instrumentation that uh, I may mention. And uh, with Greg, I'm a co-owner about the Magic Education Consultants. Greg, anything you want to say about yours? Yeah, um, my list is a little bit longer. Uh, you can see there anywhere from Alcon down to OptiView, uh, Allergan to Dompe. Um, uh, Involve is a PA medical director. I'm the PA medical director. It's a, it's a managed Medicaid. Uh, healthcare registries. I'm the chairman of diabetes registry and, and now macular degeneration. Um, really, the key is it's a long list there. I really don't put that list up there to show off, but if Joe and I as educators are gonna try and bring you up to date uh, information, uh, basically what, what it is is to basically stay in front of the curve, know what's coming to be able to bring it to the audience. But probably that bullet to the bottom, that second one to the bottom, the content and the format of this course is presented without commercial bias and doesn't claim any superior superiority over any uh, commercial products. That's probably the biggest one along with independently prepared by Joe and I and uh, half owner, as Joe said, of Optometric Education Consultants. And while you were talking about that, Greg, I popped into the, uh, into the chat, uh, Keith. Uh, actually, my practice, which is the Center for Sight uh, and, and our affiliates, we actually do a meeting in Charleston. So as such, Greg and I don't compete there, but uh, we do have uh, a meeting there. It'll probably be again uh, coming up uh, perhaps uh, April or so. We haven't we haven't booked that yet, but it, it you know just keep it keep uh, looking out. We'll advertise it here. All right, well, case one, and you know, you're everybody here is friends. We're all friends. You know, Greg and I have a lot of friends across the uh, the optometric community, and as such, you can reach out to us. People do reach out, and this is I think is a very one of the most interesting cases that we never saw. This was somebody who reached out to uh, to Greg, and Greg reached out to me, and I thought this was uh, really an outstanding thing. So if you're in a situation where you need help, yeah, you know, we're we're here. We, we we are available to help you. So don't 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 hesitate. This was sent to us from uh, I mean, a colleague. Greg knows uh, better than I. A 27 year old woman presented with urgently complaining of a painful vision loss in her right eye. She has no known medical history, and she presents with an indemnous optic nerve with hemorrhaging, an afferent pupillary defect, a superior arcuate scotoma, pain when she moves her eye, and 2070 visual acuity. Reportedly, the fellow eye is normal, and uh, essentially this is the history that we got via text and uh, a photograph that we got uh, via text. And that already brings me to polling question number one. You know, what is the likely diagnosis? Is it the myelinate optic neuritis, non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, arteritic ischemic neuropathy, infectious optic neuropathy, hereditary optic neuropathy, infiltrative neuropathy, or perineuritis? And if anybody's wondering, this is the Mendenhall Glacier uh, in Alaska. I've been there a few times. And it seems like everybody I know and their brother is either in or getting back from Alaska. Greg, have you ever been? 
You know, two states I haven't been to. One is Alaska and believe it or not, Rhode Island. Well, there is a way we can rectify at least one of those. <laughs> so I put it in the chat room. Hey, who'd, who'd go to Alaska with us for, for a live event? So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna back up so you can see. 27 year old female complaining of painful vision loss in her right eye, no known medical history, a demnosoptic nerve, hemorrhaging, afferent defects, superior arthroscotoma, pain when she moves her eye, and 2070 acuity, otherwise normal. And of course, you can left click and drag the pole out of your way if you need to see anything. So I think we're doing very well here, Greg. Let's stop sure to share the results. Looks like uh, it's not an overwhelming number, but a number of people have written demyelinating optic neuritis, a non arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, an arteritic ischemic neuropathy, infectious neuropathy, hereditary, got no takers, perineuritis, got no takers, and infiltrative, uh, got a few few uh, takers. Greg, why don't you discuss a few of these that you feel that you feel you'd like to uh, talk about, and we, you know, kind of let's work our way through this. I mean, obviously, what most people would want to bite on is uh, the quote unquote optic neuritis that might be associated with uh, multiple sclerosis or maybe even neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder. But what are your thoughts on these diagnoses, Greg? Yeah, I think the first, you know, the first two, Joe, I'll comment on would be, you know, the or the first one I'll comment on will be arteritic. Um, you know, and then non arteritic, you know, I think, um, and, you know, you've taught me this over the years or back, you know, many years ago is the you know, arteritic, you have to kind of test for it, right? So, uh, and then in order then to call it non arteritic, you still have to test for it to make sure that it's non arteritic. So uh, those two there, I think, you know, the majority of, of, of the audience here is going for uh, demyelinating um, just based on, you know, the age uh, that's there. But, you know, I think I saw a hemorrhage on that nerve um, and maybe some cotton wool spots, but uh, those would be my, uh, um, those would be my thoughts right now. Well, there are a number of things we have to consider. And, and we, we need to, we need to look at really all of uh, all of these. These are things that go through, through our head. While there's a, a tendency to have a, you know, your, your first reaction, you know, and that's good. Many times it is, it is correct. But then we all, we also have to think not only what is it, but what else can it be? And I'm going to peel off a couple hereditary optic neuropathy usually doesn't present with this, a swollen nerve like this. And it tends to be far and away in males and perineuritis. Maybe people don't uh, pick that because they're not, uh, familiar with this, that is an inflammation of the optic nerve sheath, not the optic nerve involvement, but the, the sheath. And this really shows up on a coronal uh, MRI. And perineuritis is a swollen optic nerve that is usually accompanied by very good vision, not poor vision, but very good vision. And perineuritis is uh, really very characteristic of infection and infection specifically uh, syphilis. Now, demyelinating optic neuritis, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move back to uh, the picture. There are, there are a couple of things we have to consider, okay? Age, yes, good. Visual acuity, yes. Pupil defect, yes. Scotoma, reasonable. Pain when she moves her eye. All this is very, very um, suggestive, but... If we look, it's a, it is a, an edematous optic nerve. Two-thirds of the time, optic neuritis is going to be retro bulbar and not give you a swollen optic nerve. And Greg, you made a, you made a very big point there. There's a couple of hemorrhages there. I hate to say always. I hate to say never. Because as soon as I do, a patient will go out of their way to prove me wrong. But if you diagnose optic neuritis, presumptively from demyelinating disease, and you see a hemorrhage, a disc hemorrhage, it is not optic neuritis. Optic neuritis never, I'm going to qualify that, but it never has disc hemorrhages. So while it does stink of optic neuritis, 
I think we have to consider looking a little bit deeper in a case like this. Um, Greg, could you could you actually pull up the uh, the polling polling question again for me, just so I can see what our our uh, you, know, you don't you I, don't have to I, add you don't I are can. you able to do that? Yep, okay. I can. There we go. Sorry, I should have left. I should no, that was me. I should have left mine up. Uh, arteritic anterior ischemic neuropathy is a disease of the elderly, you know, once you're over the age of 50, it is always on the menu. We've always got to consider it. Although it's more common 60s, 70s, and higher. Now, non arteritic is usually a disease kind of younger people. I think the earliest I've ever encountered it was 37 years old. And that is a hyperemically swollen optic nerve. But six to one, it is going to have an inferior defect and not a superior defect. And no, we don't actually know the reason for that anatomically, but it's a hyperemically swollen nerve. So there are a number of features here that certainly put it within the realm of possibility. But as Greg, as you mentioned correctly, you know, it is not diagnosed by what it is. It's diagnosed by what it isn't. And to call it that, we have to, you know, show that it, it isn't. Now we do, all the ischemic neuropathies, I do test for giant cell. Caveat, you know, if you got someone who's very young and it's not, not in that age range, I probably don't think about that. Infectious optic neuropathy is a huge topic. If you think of all the things that you can be infected with, toxoplasmosis, toxocariasis, you can think of Bartonella, Hensley, and Quintana for neuroretinitis and cat scratch disease, syphilis, Lyme disease. There's just a tremendous number of things. And when I'm dealing with a presumptive neuritis that could be infectious, one thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to work with a primary care physician and or an infectious disease specialist. And infiltrative optic neuropathy, and we're, we're considering the possibility of sarcoidosis or cancer. So these are all things we have to consider. And there are a number of things we have to order, including neuro, neuroimaging. So working, work, working through this diagnostic list. You know, our, our first thought is demyelinating disease, your run-of-the-mill optic neuritis, but there are features that are just not characteristics. We have to keep our mind open for other things. And in a, in a case like this, you know, and as I was consulting with Greg and the uh, and Nikki, the, the practitioner, you know, infection has to be strongly considered. You know, why is there pain? Infection causes inflammation. All right, so most anything can be painful. Uh, neuroretinitis is often cat scratch disease. It can be syphilitic. They will often present with a macular star, but that is going to be a couple of weeks into the disease. It may not be present. Uh, in that situation, a swollen nerve with a serous macular detachment early in disease course presents is a presenting find, finding for uh, infectious optic neuritis and neuroretinitis. So in this case, you know, we need a contrast and a contrast and enhanced MRI of the orbits and brain. Orbis chiasm and brain are two different studies. We have to rule out demyelination, neurosheath swelling for peroneuritis. And when we're doing it, it has to be for orbits and chiasm with fat suppression or fat sat, fat saturation, because everything looks white, you know, with fat. Fat is white. Anything that happens to the optic nerve is going to enhance white. If you don't suppress fat from the image, it's all going to blend in together. And of course, we have to look at the brain MRI for white matter lesions. And these are all things they actually write on the note uh, to the radiologist. And we also have to test for other infectious agents, Bartonella, syphilis, Lyme. I know this was a Lyme endemic area. Tuberculosis, herpes, Epstein-Barr, uh, rickettsiosis. Uh, and this is best done with a primary care physician or infectious disease. Now, I will order the imaging. Because I know what I'm looking for, I know what to order, how to order, and when to recognize when something was not done properly. The rest, I, I want a primary care physician involved in the case, and I, I find that they are very, very easy to work with. 
So we made these recommendations to the practitioner and she worked uh, with the patient and other physicians. MRI came back, optic nerve enhancement, possibly consistent with infectious autoimmune or granulomous disease, no evidence of demyelinization. So basically it's saying there's something wrong with the optic nerve and that's it. But it is saying it is not likely to be demyelinating disease. Now, all the serological testing uh, came back very high Titus Epstein Barr virus. Okay, so this was an infectious optic neuropathy. And the, these infectious organisms can directly involve and inflame the optic nerve, or you know, they can either in, infect the optic nerve or the inflammatory response to the organism will lead to an inflammatory neuropathy. There may be some vascular mechanisms in there. And that's why the patients can often have pain. So this actually came out to be an infectious optic neuropathy. So the moral of the story here is, even though it uh, it really did look like optic neuritis, there were some features that, that weren't consistent, we have to be aware of. And then we go further and ask, what else can it be? Greg, do you have any, uh, any final comments here? I don't. That was uh, a good co coverage of optic uh, neuritis or optic neuropathies. Okay. You know, the infectious optic neuropathy, syphilis can give you a retrobulbar, a, a papillopathy, a neuroretinitis, a perineuritis. You know, it can be very, very vision reducing, except for the perineuritis. Lyme disease can, can mimic syphilitic optic neuropathy and can actually cross-react. People who have Lyme disease can test positive for syphilis and vice versa. Toxoplasmosis, cytomegalovirus, these are all on the menu. You know, the neuroretinitis tends to be a, a more benign lymphoreticulosis, which we know as cat scratch disease, which almost uniformly has a, a positive outcome. And sometimes you may actually see the reduced vision. You can actually see the, the disc swelling here, but there's no macular star. The macular star usually comes a couple of weeks late into the disease. But what you'll notice you know, with an OCT, if you have, if, if you use, if you think to use it, is there, there is a serous detachment from the disc over to the macula. Not fluid, not edema serous detachment like we have right here this is a patient who had been treated presumptively for strep throat at age 62 has a massively swollen optic nerve you can actually see the serous macular detachment we see that on the oct combined with uh, a swollen nerve we don't need the macular star to make the diagnosis this is an infectious neuropathy and, you know, infectious neuropathies, neuroretinitis, there are a lot of potential etiologies. And maybe we can use this. You, you might be able to use this uh, slide in the future. You, you know, come across this. These are all things we have to consider. You know, toxo, toxocariasis, measles, syphilis, Lyme disease, herpes, simplex, and zoster, Epstein-Barr, malignant hypertension, ischemic neuropathies can look at this. Lept leptospirosis, Bartonella is most common. Uh, where fleas are their vectors. And the prognosis is that really excellent if it is uh, Bartonella and cat scratch disease. There's really no evidence that antimicrobial therapy or, or Avastin or anti-VEGF injections will, ha will help them. And if you ever have a case where it's presumptively infectious optic neuropathy, you want to prescribe something because you feel you should do something, really any oral antibiotic that you like to use will, will be as good as the next one. Craig, anything final or uh, anything in the chat room we should add? We are good. All right. Well, Greg, we've got, here's well, another We've got one. the Alaska. We've got people in for Alaska, I guess, if you want that, so. Oh, we got people in for Alaska, huh? All right. Well, here's another great case that I never saw. This actually came to me by a text one, by, from one, one of our local referring doctors, uh, a former student of mine. You know, he, call, he, he texts me, like, what do I do? This is a 22-year-old female coming in for her first eye exam with some blurred vision. She's 2040 and 2070, right and left eye, respectively. She has no medical history and a relatively thin build. And I think I'm going to go right to polling question number two, Greg. 
what's the likely diagnosis? Bilateral CRVO, do a coagulopathy workup. IIH, prescribe Diamox and weight loss. A brain tumor, get an immediate MRI. Malignant hypertension, check the blood pressure, send the ER. Infectious optic neuropathy, because that's what the last case was. And I don't know, that's why I'm here. Now, for people who are not recognizing the edifice in the background, that is a Tyne church in Prague, Czech Republic. I think it's one of the most uh, impressive edifices I've ever seen. At night when the square is lit up, it is, it is really, really impressive. So I'm going to actually go back and let you see. And if you want, if your poll's in your way, you can just uh, left click, click and drag it away. 22-year-old female, first eye exam, blurred vision, 2040, 2070 relatively petite young woman. So great. We're getting close to about 70% participation. I'm going to have you kind of uh, read the fun. Okay, so bilateral CRVO, IIH, brain tumor, Malignant hypertension, infectious neuropathy, and I don't know why, that's why I'm here to learn. Greg, why, why don't you read these fun, fun day to us? And tell me what you think and what you see here. Can you hear me, Joe? I was just trying to help someone get in. So, Oh, no worries. I, I, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. All right. So looking at this, I see a swollen nerve head. Looks like a little bit worse on the on the right eye here, I see multiple on this one for sure, cotton wool spots. Um, and that's, you know, anytime, even if I see one cotton wool spot, that concerns me, even if the retina is totally clean, but there's multiple cotton wool spots, it's telling me that there's ischemia here for sure. I see hemorrhages and it looks like definitely in the right eye there, I see that macular star. Um, and it looks like it's starting to form or there is one uh, in that left eye there. So that's what I would, uh, that's how I would read those photos in this 22 year old female. Hey, great. What, what is your workup for an isolated cotton wool spot? I just wanna, I'm gonna put, that, put you on the spot on that one, see what you think. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I mean, uh, I wanna go um, infectious to blood dyscrasia is typically where it is, uh, where I find anywhere from, you know, anemias to leukemias, uh, I guess it could be infectious. Um, I've seen it uh, be uh, autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, uh, that type of uh, condition that's out there. Um, so, um, you know, any so we have all these wide field imagings at our office and we're always looking for those holes and tears and all that fun stuff. But these isolated, uh, we probably get one about every six months into the practice. And you kind of, you know, we see these hemorrhages, I guess where I want to go with this is we see these little hemorrhages out in the periphery and they just happen sometimes. Do I work all those hemorrhages up? No. Will I follow them? Sure. Treatment is observation. So observation, uh, treatment is an observation. I'll, I will observe a peripheral hemorrhage, but I never really observe a cotton wool spot is my point. So, Excellent. So you get a situation like this, Greg. What you know? What is your what is your your approach? I mean, what what are we going to do here? We got bilateral swollen nerve and a ischemic uh, anadematous fundus. Yeah, this is uh, you know definitely a call to the primary care workup. Basically, working them up for everything that was back on your previous slide there, Joe. All those infectious optic neuropathies. Um, also, you know, explaining to them, you know, it could be other things, but, you know, that macular star there is, you know, kind of indicative in a sense where I'm going to kind of lean towards infectious. Well, also don't forget, Greg, what, what do we, what do we always tell people and what do Nancy and Valerie always tell us when you have bilaterally swollen disc? What is the first thing we should do? Always check the blood pressure. And that's what happened. I told I told uh, I told him to go back and check the blood pressure. He sent me a text back. He said it's 180 over 144. And he acknowledged that it could be higher than that. I haven't done this since optometry school. So likely diagnosis is malignant hypertension, but it could be other things. And this is a situation that we're going to uh, we're going to send right to the emergency room with some information as to what's going on.
Now, one of the red herrings, or may you may think that uh, you, you might not consider, but she's only like twenty some years old. And is this a primary hypertension in a thin 20, 20 year old, 20 something year old? The answer is no. Yeah, there may be an adrenal tumor. There may be something else going on. I don't know. That's not our job to figure out. There are other medical professionals that will do this. But, you know, we have done our job. We get her in there and then they, you know, then they know what they're going to do. And I'm going to talk very briefly about hypertensive emergencies and, and urgencies. Uh, you know, an emergency is severe hypertension with end organ damage. And, you know, they can have encephalopathies, headache, intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, chest pain, heart pain, acute myocardial infarction. There, there are a number of things, but end organs, I you start to see retinopathy, that's end organ damage. Now, a few cotton wool spots and a hemorrhage, I'm not going to treat the same way as I'm going to treat the one I, we just looked at. But these emergencies require immediate blood pressure reduction, not necessarily to normal levels, but reduction. And they're going to be you know, best admitted through the ER for aggressive treatment. They're going to be, they will be admitted to the hospital and they'll use parental medicines to, to bring them down. Urgencies, there's, it's severe hypertension, but there's no end organ damage. There's no encephalopathy. There's no, no angina. There's no retinopathy. We find this during routine examination. This is usually the person who's got chronic hypertension, who's not adhering to the drug therapy, or maybe they've not been to their PCP in a, in a while. And this is a person I'm either going to send back to their PCP, and I will, com I will communicate with the PCP personally, uh, or I'll refer them to uh, a local uh, internist uh, or family practitioner to get them started uh, on, on therapy. But this doesn't really warrant aggressive bread, uh, blood pressure reduction. Uh, this will be done kind of in a slow and controlled fashion, like very elevated pressure in uh, exfoliative glaucoma. Anything you want to you throw in there, Greg? I do. Um, and we take blood pressures at our practice on, on, on every single patient. And there's times, Joe, when someone will come in, you know, with some really, you know, high blood pressure, you know, to say 220 over, you know, 120, something to that effect. And, you know, the staff knows like, okay, we're probably going to abort the uh, eye exam today. I'm probably going to get this patient off to the, you know, we're not going to worry about whether they're, you know, shifted a quarter or, you know, need their bifocal bumped up that day. However, um, they do now know that when they get these high blood pressures, uh, we have wide field imaging at our practice to grab that image because I do want to see if there's any retinopathy or any swollen nerve heads to, to really identify that end organ damage for that primary care call that I'm going to have with the doc. So, you know, so I know a lot of us out there uh, in our practice, um, you know, we do blood pressures. Um, like I said, we do them on every patient. And uh, when that happens, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of like, okay, we're losing that patient for today, maybe saving a life or saving something to that effect. But my clinical pearl would be, we most of us have cameras, take a picture. Because it was, because it's National Ice Cream Day. But it's That's why it's it's National it's Ice loud. Cream Day. So, all right. Thanks for grabbing that one, Joe. Um, so, uh, so my point is, you know, grab that image, see what's going on in the back of that eye. Um, and then that will maybe that, that not maybe that will definitely help the primary care doc know what's going on with the, that urgency versus emergency. Yeah. And, you know, for the audience, we, we work, you know, we've got, a, we've got a friend who has presented at numerous conferences with us, uh, Dr. Robert Hasty. He's an internist and he's actually a hospitalist. He only works in the hospital in the Orlando area. And he said, yeah, please look. I, I, I mean, I, I can't look. I, I, I had a little bit of direct ophthalmoscopy in medical school, but I don't know how to use it. And I want to know that. So I, I would peanut appreciate you telling me what's, what's, what's going on. What's in peanut butter sauce? What's in peanut butter cups? And peanut All right, butter hold on. Cups, that, yeah, Joe, I'm kind of wounded. No, to help I wouldn't identify take a chance. Well, I'm not saying that. You and there okay. you go. I wonder why. They don't want to do uh, all webinars, people. All right. Forgive the, uh, run, the run on here. Case three is a 33-year-old female complaining of horizontal double vision. Uh, she's got a headache. 
She has transient visual obscurations up to 20 times a day, not blackouts, but bilateral gray outs or blur outs, lasting several seconds. Uh, she denies oral contraceptive use, tetracycline use, vitamin A use. Uh, she's on, on no medicine. She had lost about 10 pounds, and he said it actually helped her headaches. And you know, she's at 118 over 72. She's five foot five, 160 pounds, the BMI of about 2627. And she looks like this. And walking through it, we have bilaterally swollen nerves. We can see some of the major vessels, especially nasally, being lost. There's some juxtapapillary folds or patents lines. There's really no hemorrhages. There's no uh, there's no exudation. A visual field, uh, not much vision loss. There's a little bit of a superior defect in the right eye and a large blind spot in each eye, not unexpected. And what we have here on the OCT is everything juxtapapillary is so high, it's off the charts. And I always refer to this on the series as the Patriot sign, and you get the red, white, and blue because everything is really just off the scale. So that brings me to question number three, Greg, polling question number three. What's the most likely diagnosis? Is it pseudotumor cerebri? Is it idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Is it malignant hypertension? Is it a mass lesion? And I don't know, that's why I'm here, which is actually a reasonable option. And the edifice here is the Chateau Frontenac, Greg. I know you recognize that from our meetings up in Quebec City. Uh, this is also one of the most impressive edifices I've ever seen. And it's a wonderful yeah. hotel. Yeah, it's actually a pretty cool city. Joe introduced me to this city. Uh, um, it's like going to Europe without having to go to Europe. It's a really cool. If you ever guys get to go there, check it out. I'd certainly make it, put it on your to-do list. <laughs> it's back in our to-do list. We're trying to get back for our, our meeting up there. We've been put down from uh, COVID. Okay, looks like we got 82%. So I'm going to end the poll, Joe, and share those results. Okay. Very close between pseudotumor cerebri and idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And uh, the winner is yes. Uh, those are both uh, very, very, very good. But always remember, they could be something else. So let's go talk about pseudotumor and IIH. Uh, I know that that we've talked about this numerous times, and people always wonder what what is the what is the proper term to use. So I use pseudotumor. Uh, that's an old-fashioned term. Nowadays, this is 2022, we use IIH. You know, anybody use the pseudotumor is really an old-timer. And the IIH, I'm, I'm current. Well, it's not actually true. Pseudotumor is really the best term to use. Pseudotumor means there's increased intracranial pressure, but there's no tumor. There's no mass lesion. But there are other causative agents that have been identified. Uh, vitamin A use, uh, oral contraceptive use, uh, tetracycline uses, venous sinus thrombosis has all been in there. So there have been other causes. Now, if there is something exogenous or something else happening, secondary pseudotumor is the diagnosis. Now, there may be a group, there is a subset where there is increased intracranial pressure. There's no identifiable cause. There's no exogenous medication use. There is no uh, venous sinus thrombosis. And these are usually younger, overweight females. And when that happens, there's no evidence of uh, intracranial infection. We call that IIH, or it's actually primary pseudotumor. So pseudotumor is really still a very good term. It's either primary pseudotumor, IIH, or secondary pseudotumor, something else is causing. And this is all leading to poor cerebral spinal fluid drainage. Now, we don't want to presumptively look at a patient like this and make our diagnosis. We want to work through it. All right, we have to evaluate these patients. You need signs and symptoms consistent with increased intracranial pressure, 
Uh, transit visual obscuration, headache are all very common things. Uh, transient diplopia and disc edema or papilledema. And I will caution you, it may be subtle. And they also have to have a normal neurologic exam. They can have nothing else neurologically wrong with them, except they can have a cranial nerve six palsy in either unilateral or bilateral. And the reason for this is when the, in, when the intracranial pressure elevates, it forces the brainstem to herniate down through frame and magnum to, uh, to a certain extent that it can. And this causes stretching of the, of the sixth nerve across the clivus, giving you that horizontal diplopia. Neuroimaging has to be normal. It can be no hydrocephalus, no mass lesion, no blood, no structural lesion, and no venous sinus thrombosis. And the venous sinus thrombosis is actually pretty important. That's why these patients will get a contrast enhanced MRI of the brain and an MRV. They need a mag magnetic resonance veneography looking for a transverse sinus uh, uh, thrombosis. And the CSF has to be normal. There can be no blood, no white cells, no red cells. And of course, it has to be elevated on lumbar puncture. Now, nowadays, lumbar puncture may be deferred if the MRI and the MRV show no abnormalities. And what you can actually see on a good MRI is the cella turcica looks empty. Now, the pituitary gland, which sits in the cella turcica, is a gelatinous structure. It will it'll be squashed down so it looks like there's nothing in the, in the cella. And if you look at the, uh, at the globes, it's actually... The globes are actually, the back part of the globe is actually flattened from expression of cerebral spinal fluid pressure uh, in that common uh, optic nerve subarachnoid sheath. So all that together is actually pretty diagnostic of, of pseudotumor. And of course, they can't have any fever or any, any infect, infectious disease. And they, you know, if they have a typical profile, the, the LP may not be done. Greg, any thoughts? It's more of a question, Joe, and, and I just want to make sure I have this clear. So TVOs, are they typically bilateral? They're typically bilateral. Yeah. So the, the, the key here that I want to kind of point out to the audience is, you know, is it a TVO versus a transient ischemic attack? Transient ischemic attacks are typically unilateral where TVOs are bilateral. So it's just kind of separating out these kind of these vision losses. That's all I really wanted to point out. Yeah, that's great. Joe, that, that, that's great. And that's, that's uh, you know, that's a blackout versus a gray out. You're going to say, Greg? Yep. No, you answered it. That's why I just kind of wanted that. Actually, it was going to be my question. You read my mind is that, uh, you know, a, T, uh, uh, a TIA is more blackout. And it's this kind of these TVOs are kind of, you know, they didn't lose blackout. They just kind of grayed out. Yep. That's all I wanted to say. Yep. Yeah, and good. they're they're only a few seconds and they happen quite frequently during the day. Greg, this is your case. So what we want you uh, want you lead us through this one. Yeah, this was a uh, 16 year old boy that came in. Uh, vision has been fluctuating for about six weeks. Uh, the primary care physician felt that it was just a normal growth spurt. Mom feels it's migraine. There's a strong family history. She kind of feels bad that the the, the migraines have been passed on to the to the 16 year old boy. Comes in uncorrected acuity is great. He's coming in just for the regular old checkup 2020. In the right and left, externals look great. You know, he's using an inhaler for the, uh, asthma as needed. Doesn't have to use it that often. And for his uh, acne, he's using minocycline, 50 milligrams uh, twice a day. And 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 here we are with the uh, with uh, with his nerve heads. So, Joe, did you set this up for the polling question or? Oh, let's see. No, it, 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 it uh, I don't think it is a polling question. Okay. So uh, it's not rare if it's in your chair. Here we are with bilateral swollen nerve heads. Now, you know, your first thing would be to jump to would be to go with minocycline. But, you know, as Joe alluded to earlier in the presentation, we did not um, have this patient's uh, blood pressure. Now, again, we check everyone's blood pressure coming in. I can tell you that this 
first thing we'd want to do here on this bilateral swollen nerve head is not think brain tumor. Let's not think infectious, infiltrative. Let's check the blood pressure. And uh, basically, uh, it turned out to, to be uh, fine. Now, he does have bilateral swollen nerve heads here. So we are leaning towards that this is probably the minocycline, but you know he could have swollen nerve heads from minocycline, but he can also have a brain tumor. So we also, patients can have as many things as they want. So we're gonna wanna do the bilateral swollen nerve head workup. And Joe, I know this is kind of your sweet spot. So what do we do for a bilateral swollen nerve head with a normal IOP? Well, one of the first things that you're gonna do uh, when the patient's in your chair is you're gonna take the photographs, do an OCT and a visual field, check the pupils, check the vision. The reason I'm saying this is obviously this patient's going to be with other medical professionals. Once they get downstream, none of this is going to get done. So don't forget to do what you know how to do. That's going to be very important to be part of the, uh, of the healthcare process. Now, this is a person who's going to need an MRI. You're going to need a brain MRI contrast enhanced. You don't need orbits and chiasm. That's not necessary here, but you need a brain MRI. You also need an MRV. Uh, in the case that there's any, nothing else there, they're going to probably get a lumbar puncture with cerebral spinal fluid analysis. You may also want to recommend the potential to, uh, or the, the idea to look for some of the infectious causes that we have there too. Particularly, I know, Greg, this is your patient. You're in Pennsylvania. That is Lyme endemic. Is that not? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So there are a number of things that we're going to, we're going to help the, the physicians with. We just don't send the patient to the ER with nothing. And always, and I always give my cell phone to the patient because I want them to give that if it's going to an ER to the ER physician, because they will call, they, you know, they may pay to have an ophthalmologist uh, on, on staff. I, I can almost guarantee it. It's hard to get them to come in to help out. Sorry to say that, but I have encountered that. So if you can help, I always give them my information. Oh, I guess I did have a polling question. Polling question number four. I think it may be superfluous. I'm sorry about that, Craig. Yeah, what's the most likely diagnosis? Pseudotumor, IIH, malignant hypertension, mass, or I'm not really sure. That's why I'm here. And the back the background there is Bouchard Gardens. It's a wonderful botanical garden in Victoria, British Columbia on Vancouver Island. If you ever have a chance to go there, you may think, well, botanical garden sounds kind of boring. It is not. It is wonderful. You know, Joe, you made a great comment there about working with the primary care docs, working with the emergency room docs, you know, and I think, you know, what happens is a lot of times we just send these patients off and I can tell you, I've been in the community now for 27 years and by not being afraid to pick up the phone and not being afraid to say, Hey, look, you know, I want to help you here. I might not be the most in-depth person, but you know, I can tell you the eye findings you know, and these things that we talk about, you know, where, you know, what I'll say to the patient, that's why I like pointing out these different uh, clinical pearls for you, is that the, the neurologist or the doc on call uh, might be going, okay, is this a TIA? And you kind of want to point out like, look, it's not TIA because it's not a blackout. This is more gray out. And you're working as a team can really help out and they really appreciate that. So um, as the polling question was rolling in here, you know, Joe and I are big advocates of picking up the phone, working with that, and they really, really enjoy that. Okay, so if we share the results, uh, people are, are leaning toward uh, pseudotumor, IIH. Some people say mass lesion. You got to rule out. You got to rule out brain tumor. There's no question about it. Uh, pseudotumor means, you know, no tumor. You got to rule it out. But if you do all that, the MRI, MRV, LP, and you work through, and there is nothing, uh, there's nothing there, 
we can probably ascribe, ascribe it to the minocycline. And thus, our best term is pseudotumor or, or secondary pseudotumor. Um, how ur the question came, how urgent is the imaging? Well, if you got a patient who doesn't have vision loss, there's no vision loss, it isn't necessarily a situation where you need to send them to the ER, but the ER can be efficient in getting all the testing done and all the consults, but only if you if you are willing to help them. You know, so they, they should probably go within the next day or so. And is LP more readily available that for insurance than MRI? I don't think that it is. They they're going to try to do CAT scans. CAT scans really aren't good enough uh, unless you can't do the MRI. Uh, MRI is actually probably easier to obtain and, and less and more cost effective than, than lumbar puncture. It's getting harder to get lumbar puncture. You know, Greg, you, you, you tell an interesting story that I had forgotten about when, when you discussed this case with me and, it, it, and how I, I, I explain IIH versus pseudotumor. You want to go through that if you remember? Uh, absolutely. And uh, Joe, I want to point out here you know, for the LP more readily available uh, uh, for insurance is other than an MRI is that you're still going to want to get some type of imaging before. I'm not sure if you covered this or not, but you're going to want to get some type of imaging, whether it's a CAT scan or an MRI before first. doing a lumbar puncture first, because if they do have a true tumor and there is buildup, you're going to push herniate uh, your brainstem down through the frame and magnum. So, you know, you're always going to get some type of imaging first before doing the uh, LP. And Joe, you have the, I was going to make some comments here of, with uh, the polling questions here. You have, you know, pseudotumor cerebri and idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And, you know, before we knew that it was, you know, in a sense, the case here goes out and plays out. Child turns out normal. Everything's good. We discontinue the minocycline on this patient and the optic nerve heads go back to being normal. So now we can switch this from being idiopathic uh, intracranial hypertension to secondary, right? It's, you know, I see, and I used to do this all the time and Joe and I were sitting discussing this case. And the funny part was, you know, he, he said, he goes, Oh, what did it turn out to be? I said, Oh, it turned out to be idiopathic intracranial hypertension. He goes, what was it from? I said, minocycline. He goes, what was your diagnosis? Uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And this was kind of like Wimbledon was just a few days ago. And, you know, that match went on for four hours and it went on pretty long until I figured out, all right, what's he trying to get to here? Oh, and then we figured it out. It's not really idiopathic whenever you know it's from uh, minocycline. So, you know, you can call this a secondary uh, pseudotumor cerebri or secondary intracranial hypertension because now we know what it was from. It was from the minocycline. Last question, 50 milligrams is enough to cause swelling? And the answer is uh, yes, these exogenous chemicals uh, in some patients can inhibit cerebral spinal fluid absorption by the arachnoid villi and that, le that leads to the increased intracranial pressure. And I'll even take that a step further, Keith, is that, you know, I think this child was on at 50 milligrams twice a day and, uh, and um, once a day can certainly do that. So what we have here at the top, it looks like the optic nerves um, looks like there looks like the middle two might be the, the first and middle might be the same there, Joe, but the bottom uh, was it originally. And this is over a 48 day uh, period. You could see that we just discontinued the, the minocycline, the optic nerve heads went back to normal. Um, you know, not, not, there was no visual complications, but you can see top versus bottom uh, swelling versus no swelling. You know, this is just a reminder here, this little cartoon, you know, maybe the next time you should wear a little sunscreen to remind us that the oral tetracyclines, minocycline or doxycycline can create photosensitivity. Doxycycline, if you remember the old uh, uh, pregnancy categories, category uh, um, uh, A, B, C, D, and then there was X. Uh, D was just bad and X was really bad. You know, A and B was okay to give and then C and D you had to think about a little bit. Remember that uh, doxycycline is and minocycline and tetracyclines are category D. Really anything can enhance Coumadin. Luckily, we're getting into some better uh, uh, antiplatelet type of medications that are out there. So it's just not tetracycline that can uh, in effect really 
uh, Coumadin or Warfin is very, very, uh, 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 you know, very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, particular type of drug, persnickety type of drug, where it likes to just react to anything. Um, and then digoxin, that's the one there. This is a fun call here. We use minocycline, doxycycline to treat meibomian gland dysfunction. These are really not reasons. Enhance Coumadin, enhance digoxin. You heard Joe and I, you hear us keep our theme is you got to pick up the, the, the phone here. Um, you can call your primary care doc, the internist, and tell them they're going to be uh, using this. The internist will get their, uh, for the uh, Coumadin, will get their blood work for their uh, clotting times. You have to call the cardiologist for digoxin uh, that's out there. And, you know, the, the cardiologist will go, oh, it's minocycline, doxycycline. It's an antibiotic. You're only going to be using it for a short period of time. And that's when you have to go, no, 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 no. It's probably going to be six to 12 months, maybe longer. Uh, and they'll be like, okay, thanks for calling. We'll get their dig levels checked. I've been doing this, talking about minocycline and doxycycline for years. Somewhere, someone was teaching about this high risk for breast cancer. Basically, it's been discredited. It's not the best uh, uh, study that was done. And then uh, benign intracranial hypertension. You know, there were 17 cases reported uh, in that time period that I have there. And it's just because, you know, we don't really report these cases. So I always like pointing out, I work in a 5OD practice. We probably are about 3.5 uh, full-time equivalent in that practice. And we get one of these about once a quarter. So... And then you have to be careful with, uh, with this medication. This is a patient of mine that came in. I'm treating her for my bony and gland dysfunction. And, you know, I just said to her, I said, hey, Lois, what's going on? What's new? How's everything going? She goes, hey, doc, my eyes are great. Um, but check what's going on with my legs. And she pulls her pant legs up. And I literally just hit my forehead. And she goes, doc, why are you hitting your forehead? I said, because uh, I did this to you. And she looked at me and she goes, what? She goes, I've been all around. No one can really figure it out. I've had some blood work. I had this, I had that. I even had a little biopsy. And uh, I said, yeah, remember when I told you that minocycline and doxycycline can create these pigmentations? Um, this is exactly what happened to her. We chatted with her. I chatted with her primary care doc. We stopped the medication. And you can see, Joe, if you put some slides in there, um, there, there, there we go. We can see six months. Uh, later, do you have the year later in there? And then one year later, do you have the uh, the before and after beside that? There we go. So, so there she is before. There she is. She did fade over time. You can see that the medication does uh, something with that iron, and it just builds up. But I point of this is, you know, we see patients all the time coming in with this for for acne using it for many skin conditions. They're on it long-term. And I kind of ask them from time to time, do they notice any pigmentations? And not because I prescribed it, they've been prescribed by other docs. And I can tell you probably about once a year, someone will be like, hey, look, you're talking about this here. You look at my fingernails. Um, I should take some pictures of these and uh, share them. But uh, pigmentation, hyperpigmentation. And if you don't Trust me on it. Not that it, you say that, but if you want to do a little, a little clinical research on your own, you know, I always tell people go to Google or your favorite search, search engine, just type two words, minocycline or doxycycline, one or the other hyperpigmentation, hit enter, just those two words, pick whichever one you want, hit enter, look at images, and you'll see all kinds of images that are out there. But, you know, my final comment on this would be, I don't put these pictures in here, digoxin and warfarin and enhanced photosensitivity and these pigmentations uh, for the fact that not to use these medications. It's a reminder that these medications can have adverse side effects. And, uh, you know, and, and, and this is, uh, you, know, you know, why, you know, optometry is very well plugged into the healthcare system with all the state associations out there that fought and gave us these rights. So use these things, but then plug yourself in and work with the, with the docs that are out there as you kind of hear Joe and I's theme. Very good, Greg. I, I think that if you, if anybody were to go to Google images and, and put in minocycline and uh, hyperpigmentation, I think uh, Greg's picture comes up. <laughs> yeah, I've done it more than once, believe it or not. So, 
<laughs> All right, 13 year old theme referred for painless reduced vision 2040 in her left eye with a concurrent abnormal screening visual field, a reportedly elevated intraocular pressure, and an afferent pupillary defect. Her previous exam was three weeks early and she had been pre and it had been previously referred to an ophthalmologist over a year earlier by another optometrist, but her mother didn't know why and did not take her. Key piece of diagnostic information was her pressure. She was 28 and 43 by Goldman Applination. Pachymetry is slightly thick uh, in the 590 range. There was no uh, biomicroscopic uh, or gonioscopic abnormalities. The anterior safe segment, both angles were open, and this is what her fundi looked like. I'll take, let you have a second to uh, digest that. So 13 years old, had been seen over a year ago, referred out, never went, comes in. Uh, pressure's 28 and 43, and uh, her fundi look like that. So, so Joe, let me just kind of clarify here. 13 years old with an IOP of 28 and 43. Okay, thanks. Yes, okay. So it brings me to the next polling question. This is my view from uh, one, of, one of the Rolling Stones concerts that I had gone to. Uh, I had a very good, uh, very good view of, uh, of the band. In fact, if you look and you focus in, you can even see the set list. So what's the most likely diagnosis? An orbital tumor causing cupping and elevated pressure? Primary open angle glaucoma, juvenile open angle glaucoma, or I don't know, that's why I'm here. So what's the most likely diagnosis? Do we have a tumor causing cupping and pressure? Regular old fashioned glaucoma, juvenile glaucoma, or I don't know, that's why I'm here. Hey, Joe, can you go back and let's, um, are you able to see the kind of more of the history there? I know we had another case. It's not this case, but uh, is this patient on any uh, systemic medications? No, none at all. Okay, so no systemic medications that could be causing this. Okay. Or, yeah, you can't lift it on any. So, okay, perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right. So, and I think we'll end the poll, share the results. And the vast majority say it's juvenile open angle glaucoma. And that is a correct diagnosis. Juvenile open angle glaucoma is an open angle glaucoma diagnosed during childhood. It happens somewhere after the third birthday, but certainly before the 16th birthday. If you look in the literature, it even, you know, it, it reaches all the way up to early adulthood, up to age 40 or 45. I don't really buy that. I mean, if you showed me a 35-year-old person with a pressure of 28, a uh, little bit of a notched optic nerve and a bit of a nasal step. I'm going to call that primary open angle glaucoma. Not common, but I'm going to call it POAG. You show me 38-year-old end-stage disease, I think, well, that probably was juvenile. That was never diagnosed. It tends to be more aggressive uh, than primary open angle glaucoma, but the anterior segment, anterior chamber angle are all normal. It's not a congenital developmental infantile glaucoma. It is open angle glaucoma that occurs in the child. And I have seen a number of, uh, of patients because of what I did at the university in the glaucoma service. I've treated a number of the children with JOAG. In fact, this is the first thing that was actually chromosomally identified because it is such a strong autosomal dominant uh, condition. Now, this is what I mean. This is, uh, this is a, an adult uh, who I saw, Edna, and we can see her optic nerves and her visual fields. And, you know, she, she is actually very young. And we take, you know, we take a look at this and I'm gonna call this juvenile open angle glaucoma because this disease didn't happen just a couple of years ago. She has been long un undiagnosed. So there's probably a developmental immature of the trabecular meshwork. The, uh, the endothelial cell lining the inner wall of Schlem's canal don't have the giant vacuoles. You know, some abnormal deposition of ground substance. But goniscopically, it looks normal. 
You're not going to pick up any of this. This is all histologic. Here is a very important uh, caveat or clinical pearl I'm going to give you. There are no normal tension juvenile glaucoma patients. I've seen this disease numerous times. I, I've had, uh, I think the youngest I've had was eight years old uh, up until the teens. They, it's not even. It's not equivocal. The pressure is always elevated. I'm not talking 19, 20, 20. I'm talking 30s and 40s. There is no normal tension in juvenile glaucoma. Pressure is going to be high. So if you got a suspicious looking nerve and a 15 pressure, it's not. Right? You've got a, a congenitally anomalous nerve. You've got a large nerve, large cup. You're going to do your OCT. It's going to be normal. Maybe you get a visual field. It's going to be normal. It's not normal tension juvenile glaucoma. Now, managing these patients all the, is all situational. You know, we have to look about it. And I will, uh, you know, sometimes surgery is better. Sometimes medicines are better. But don't look at them just as, as tiny adults. We have to consider the, the medicines that can be used. Topical beta blockers are actually very safe and effective in children, and they tend to, to tolerate them better than adults. Now, we always reach for our prostaglandin analog. They are very safe. They are very well tolerated. They just don't work. And we don't know why. Maybe what the mechanism that prostaglandins thrive on requires a certain amount of time for the uveal sclera mesh work to develop this situation. They just don't work. I've seen it in the literature. I've proven it myself. I've used it. They don't work. You give me a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, it might work. Anything younger? Probably not. Topical carbonic and hydrase inhibitors, your ASOPs and, and your, your TRUSOPs, it's actually a good option. It's safe and effective and more effective in children than adults. We don't think about that as a sole agent for adults, but it does work. And bromonidine works, but it's just unacceptable side effects. Um, anything eight years or, or under should not be used. It's actually induced coma in children. Now, you give me a, a, a 14, 15 year old who, you know, is, you know, pre, you know, post, you know, post prepubescent, you know, good, good body size, I would consider it as a last option. Ultimately, these patients end up on a dorsal, dorsolamide uh, Tim Law combination, and it usually works very well for them. In fact, this young woman, she got down, this young girl, she got down to uh, to the mid-teens with, uh, with medical therapy. It worked very well, actually. Now, pediatric glaucoma, you know, the infantile congenitals, they have an abnormal angle. The, 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 the globe is enlarged. It's called bupthalamus. Bupthalamus used to mean cow eye because it looks like a, a cow's eye. It's so large. You can have corneal edema. They're very symptomatic. They're photophobic. They're lacrimating. They're blepharospasming. And these are infants uh, from the corneal edema. And they have large corneas, which are very, very cloudy. Now, others, you know, juvenile, Normal angle, normal axial length, clear cornea. A little bit later onset, normal corneal size. They typically are asymptomatic. Greg, any thoughts? Yeah, they're, they're just more questions for, in my mind, Joe, for, the, for those cases. Um, the first one would be, since you've seen these down when you were at the university, um, where I practice, I'm in a very white population. Um, and I'm thinking back, geez, you know, I've been there for 27 years. Do I have anyone three years old to, you know, to that 35 year old being treated, man, I think maybe one patient and, you know, we've got again, that th five docs, but say three and a half full-time equivalent. Um, is it more of a certain race that seems to be involved or is it, in, or does the literature say it's just kind of scattered all over the place? Well, my experience was Afro-Caribbean, but again, when I was at South Florida, that was the a lot of the population that I was, I was seeing, so that would be skewed. Um, it is very common, but it is very common in that population. I've had some suspects who are Caucasian, but they only turned out to be suspects. So I'm going to say it, it is fairly common in the Afro-Caribbean, okay. more so than anything else. And that might explain it. Um, 
you know, I have some people that are in their, you know, in their fourth decade, which would be their thirties that I'm following them for ocular hypertension. And maybe um, I might have one or two now that knowing the definition that in their thirties, they got glaucoma and you know, I'd probably call them primary open angle glaucoma, but maybe by definition, I can say I had a couple of juvenile open angles. Um, yeah, the I, other, I, I like making that diagnosis under age 18, unless like that 30 year old is end stage disease. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's a good point out there. Um, the, the other thing you mentioned that I thought, and you know, I like, we lecture with Tracy, Dr. Offerdahl, she's a pharmacist. Um, and you mentioned, and this might be something we put one of, in our okay. lectures is you talk about bromonidine potentially, would you say causing seizures? Is that what you mentioned? No, coma. Uh, or coma. Somnolence uh, and coma. So is that topical or would, you know, we know that this is a me too drug, which started off as a systemic medication. Can the topical do that? Yes. Okay. So that's good. Yep. Good to know on that. And then I, you kind of mentioned it, but um, you know, if you had to ballpark it, um, you know, I'm kind of thinking, boy, this young and some of those nerves you showed, is it most likely that they end up because of the early onset that they move on to some type of surgical intervention or do, do they do pretty well with topicals? Is it 50, 50? Is it 70, 30, 30, 70? It's, it's, it's 50, 50. Uh, I've had a number of, of these patients that I could control topically and they actually did very well. Uh, and some, I actually, I actually had a brother and sister that I diagnosed four years apart. And he actually did very well. Uh, and he is now, he, he actually went into uh, adulthood and still on topical therapy. Uh, his sister, who I diagnosed at age eight, I diagnosed him at age 10. His sister, I got her pressure ameliorated as best I could until she got insurance and ultimately had a couple of procedures. I think in a situation like this, uh, probably the most uh, efficacious surgical procedure would be one of the modified goniotomies, such as a hook dual blade, because so there just, is some abnormality in the trabecular meshwork. So keep going with that because Marilyn, there's some questions rolling into the chat box here. Uh, Marilyn asked, you know, SLT question mark. Now that you're talking about that trabecular meshwork. Uh, SLT is not going to be really, not really going to do much uh, in a situation like this. And, you know, it, it's just too ephemeral. You'd have to remove that tissue, maybe with a cook dual grip blade. Any other questions? <laughs> I, yeah. And then Thomas put in there, except for uh, your, uh, for your aminocycline patients. I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I know where he's going with that, but then another one rolled in, you know, how would you use your OC to monitor a child with glaucoma? since they're outside the norm age uh, by carrying the, uh, by comparing the progression in themselves. And I see where you're going with that, uh, Michelle. I think it's Michelle. Yep. Um, is that, uh, um, is that you're not going to get, you know, because they don't have the, you know, the red, green, uh, blue, yellow that's out there. And, you know, that's why I'm a big advocate. I teach a lot of OCT courses. You kind of just need to know those numbers, you know, what's normal, but really probably the best thing to do is, you know, if you're looking to see the diagnosis um, is, you know, look for asymmetry, but you know, it does make it challenging because they don't have the red, the green and the numbers there, but you, it will track the numbers over time. It just doesn't give you that normative database. Yeah, Greg, what I, what I did in those situations was I would, I would run it. I run the OCT and then I'd run the OCT again, making them 18 years old. And that's actually something that was also advocated by uh, two doc, two glaucoma, pediatric glaucoma specialists, uh, Elizabeth Hodap and Alana Grajewski. They said, just make them 18 years old. It's not going to make a big difference in the, in the long term. But when you, when you actually have the, the funny looking nerve in a child and the pressure is normal, you know, run the LCT, take a picture and give it to the parents because this is something that's going to haunt them for their entire lives. And they have that backup data with you. You're going to be good. And so it says, keep the kids away from Lumify. Uh, potentially, yes. It's a very, very weak combination, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't recommend that in a, obviously in an eight-year-old. Excellent. 
53-year-old man presents uh, who's been treated for advanced glaucoma, one of my long-term patients, presents with slowly progressive painless loss of vision in his right eye. He missed his visits about the past year, but he's been obtaining medicine from the refills, the pharmacy, probably, you know, probably bugging me online. And I probably just gave it to him. His vision it is now light perception. A year earlier, it was 2200. Three years earlier, it was uh, 2070 with fixation loss from glaucoma. So here, you know, three years ago, he's 2070 because, you know, he, he lost his fixation from advanced disease. They dropped to 2200. Now he's light perception. So it brings me to polling question number six. And there's the Grand Canyon for those who have not been. What's the most likely cause? Advancing glaucoma, snuff out of vision, orbital tumor, cataract, or I don't know. That's why I'm here. Yeah, Joe, it's kind of funny. The first time I saw the Grand Canyon, I said, oh, now I know why they call it the Grand Canyon. It's definitely mm -hmm. not misnomer. So. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in my in my wife's family, there is this uh, what I what I have called the urban legend about her brother who played football and the family claimed that he, you know, he was at the bottom, put some rocks in, in, in a backpack and ran up, ran up the, the uh, side, which I think everybody who's been there realizes it's impossible. But there are people in, in her family who actually believe it happened. All right. And Paul, Advancing glaucoma stuff out of vision makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. You know, that, you know, that would be our first thought until we actually take a look and that's what he looks like. <laughs> what do you see there, Greg? I see a great white there, Joe. Yep, yeah, he's got the great white, the great white cataract. And, uh, you know, this is a person who's got a mature, hyper mature, probably soon to be phacolytic lens. And, you know, one may wonder why, you know, why does this happen uh, in the United States? Well, it happens, uh, well, in a situation like this, the person who was uninsured and never really followed through well with uh, health care. But when, when somebody determines that cataract surgery is not going to result in a, a beneficial to return of vision, such as a person who's got some sort of maculopathy, retinopathy, uh, or advanced glaucoma, the cataracts will uh, will set and you end up with a hypermature situation. Now, what what is the issue here? A lens-induced glaucoma. You can have phacal lysis where it, it lyses down and gives you a an inflammatory response uh, that can be very quite you know quite painful. Or phacomorphic, where the shape of the lens causes pupil block and angle closure. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about lens particle or, or retained lens fragments or, or misplaced lens. But, you know, these lens-induced glaucomas do happen. They're, they're fairly interesting, sometimes kind of exciting to, uh, to see and diagnose. I, I've had a number of them. Phacomorphic is probably the most common, but phacolytic will induce this. And, you know, when we get to a situation like this, the question becomes, is it medically necessary to remove the cataract? And the answer is, well, sort of. You know, situa situations like these, uh, if there's a pupil block and angle closure in an eye that doesn't have good visual potential, iridotomy and medicines will probably be sufficient. And a situation like this, uh, that's phacolytic, uh, if, uh, if there, again, is no visual potential, that's why the cataract was allowed to get that bad. They have retinopathy, maculopathy, or, or really advanced glaucoma. You know, atropine and steroids can be used uh, really indefinitely. I'm looking at the chat, saw tons of stuff like that in East North Carolina. We had insurance, indeed, yes. You know, there, there are a reason. And Barb says, with cataract case, you know, you, you, we don't have enough info option. Okay, I agree. But, you know, this is supposed to be challenging. All right, how about this one? Case hey, Joe, let, let, me, yeah. let, me make, let me make a clinical pearl sure. there. Is um, uh, when you send that to a surgeon, sometimes you see that come back and there's like this blue stuff in the, in the anterior chamber or maybe the capsule or maybe there's a little higher IOP. 
Um, you know, this, when you, when, when you send out for surgery, one of the toughest things, one of the toughest parts of cataract surgery now is making that capsule orexis. Um, and I was talking to a surgeon one time and they were talking about, think about like tearing a, a potato chip bag. And actually the surgeon used to tear and practice on a potato chip bag. And when that capsule starts to radialize, think about like when you open up a potato chip bag and it starts to tear, man, when it's just, it just wants to keep going and going. And when that capsule, when it starts to kind of start to go posterior, starts to go behind, and they're trying to make that perfect capsule erexis, well, they need to be able to see what they're doing. And when they stick the needle in there and start tearing, that capsule is kind of liquefied and it's white. So sometimes what they'll do is they'll stain, I think it's what's called Taipan blue. They'll stain that capsule blue. And then whenever they're tearing everything, it's white, they can still see where they're going. So they, you know, just a little bit of a clinical pearl and kind of a long drawn out way that um, if you do see one of those, you might want to pick your cataract surgeon. If they've been doing it for years, um, you might see a little blue in the anterior chamber. It's that type and blue for that capsule rexus. Okay, pearl for people to, to, uh, to be aware of. All right, Greg, case seven, 25-year-old woman involved in a minor trap automobile accident where she was hit by another driver. Uh, probably, a, it was probably bumper. Very minor, no initial injury, either driver, both cars were able to be driven away. She only had a, a mild to moderate bump during the accident, no head trauma, no loss of consciousness. I, I guess if we think about it, probably... The best thing to uh, analogize it for, uh, to uh, for the experienced practitioners out there, were bumper cars. I mean, it's not like a bumper car uh, accident. But next morning, she woke up. She had no physical pain. She had profound double vision. That brings me to polling question number seven. What's the likely cause? Is it a subarachnoid hemorrhage? A third nerve palsy, an orbital fracture, a fourth nerve palsy, a sixth nerve palsy, or help. I don't know. That's why I'm here. Or maybe we can put that in as uh, also, we need more information. What's your issue? Now, can you, go, can what, you go back, Joe, to the symptoms? Can you go back? Sure. To the, uh, can you go back? Yep. Minor traffic accident, uh, just a bump. No injuries, both cars were driven away, no, no, uh, no head trauma, no loss of consciousness. But next morning she woke up, she had profound double vision. And if you're wondering, this is a nice little harbor town. This is Auckland, New Zealand. They have their own kind of little space needle there. I always consider it Auckland and Seattle to be very, very similar cities. And you can actually jump off of that uh, and, and actually live. Uh, not bungee, but they actually have a control descent. You can actually drop off. I think I saw one person do it while I was there. All right. Most likely cause, we have some subarachnoid hemorrhage, some fourth nerve palsies, a couple other palsies. Okay. It was vertical double vision. Worse at near, and she had a distinct, we look at the Purkinje images, distinct right hyperdeviation. Uh, an alternate cover test was worse than left gaze and right head tilt, and she had a fourth nerve palsy. And this is pretty common uh, in kids uh, from trauma or congenital. An adult is often decompensating. You can certainly see the hyperdeviation. We look at the, uh, at the Purkinje images. Uh, when they tilt to the side uh, involved, it's going to be a, a increase in the hyperdeviation. And this young woman, this young girl here, we're actually looking at a double fourth nerve palsy. She has a left fourth nerve palsy, and Dolly has a right fourth nerve palsy. So that's a double fourth nerve palsy. Yeah, I just want to make the comment uh, for the picture up and to the right there where the child is leaning in the direction of the same eye, the right eye, and they're leaning to the right and it makes it worse. And it was, uh, I think it was Dr. Larry Gray that who has since passed uh, uh, that taught me that, you know, whenever you, once you learn the mechanism of the, the actions of the muscle, we know that kind of this fourth nerve kind of attaches in the back of the eye 
and then you know through the trochlear you know that little pulley system it kind of pulls the eye down and rotates it in and when the muscle can't do that anymore the nerves not allowing it to do it then the neck muscles have to be able to take it into place and so the patient that they you are know, we hate double vision so that's why these people end up with these head tilts is because since their eye can't do it the muscle of their eye they use their head now to use the the to make up the 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 uh the uh the the action of the muscle so that's why they end up with that head tilt the way they do yeah interesting a lot of times you'll walk into you'll you'll walk into a room and you actually see a patient with it with a compensatory head tilt and you know i know when i walk in i'm going to be looking at uh, at, at a fourth nerve palsy now, every now and then, patients will do something exactly the opposite. You know, the reason that they, do, they, they, they have a compensatory head tilt is to make them they feel more comfortable. Sometimes patient, they'll tilt to the, to the uninvolved side. Sometimes a patient will tilt to the involved side. And the reason they do it, it actually induces uh, worsening and suppression. And they feel the more, most comfortable. So every now and then, patients will will play dirty tricks on you. You know, I I, I had a patient with a fourth nerve palsy, and uh, and she had corneal scarring. So she was actually fixating with her paretic eye, and it really kind of threw off her uh, her her motilities, and it looked like she had a, a palsy on the other side. Now this is traumatic. And the majority of these are traumatic. And it doesn't take a lot of trauma. It doesn't take eye trauma, head trauma. Sometimes people just fall on their backside, ice skating, something like that. That could be enough to do it. Because this exits the brainstem posteriorly and decusates the anterior medullary vellum, goes around the brainstem. It's got the longest course. Uh, it goes to the cavernous sinus, the superior orbital fissure, and because of it, it is the most prone to trauma. And it doesn't have to have a lot of trauma. Now, the third nerve and the sixth nerve, they're pretty well buried. Yes, you can get a traumatic third, you can get a traumatic sixth. You need a lot of trauma. You don't need, it's not little trauma, it's a lot of trauma. Case in point, uh, I saw a 15-year-old with a traumatic sixth nerve palsy, had been assaulted, hit in the head with a cinder block. Uh, on imaging, the cinder block, a piece of cinder block was still embedded in the skull with an abscess. That's what's going to cause, not a little bump, but a little bump can cause a fourth nerve palsy. And a lot of times these patients are going to you know, decompensate. And I, we have the rule of 40, 30, 20, 10. 40% of these are traumatic. 30% are ischemic vascular, or, or, or it, I'm sorry, 40% are traumatic. 30% are idiopathic. 20% are ischemic vascular. And 10% are due to things like CNS lesions or other bad things. So automatically, when you're dealing with it, you've got a 90% chance that there's nothing going to be serious. In my career, I can only think of one person that I've imaged with a fourth nerve palsy. And it was after I got to my new practice at Center for Sight, one of my early patients, because I do the neuro op there, was a 70-something-year-old male who had a fourth nerve palsy, uh, new onset, no compensatory head tilt, uh, two prism diopter base down in front of the eye, made him feel great. But there are two uh, mitigating factors. He said, you know, Doc, my gripper is off. I, you know, I, I don't feel like I got strength in my hand. Okay. Hemiparesis. Also, history. He is under maintenance chemotherapy for lung cancer. This is a person that had a fourth nerve palsy, but there were complications. Like, you know, one of the only ones I've ever imaged, I saw him on a Thursday. By Monday, he was in hospice due to brain metastases. But for the most part, you're, you're golden. 90% chance that this is something that is relatively benign. So, Joe, what we can do is you have your rule of 40, 30, 20, 10. Um, he just came in before, uh, uh, before I, I set off onto the road last week. He was either in on Tuesday or Wednesday. And uh, he was an ischemic. So they're 20%. He was an ischemic fourth nerve palsy. Um, caught him right at the beginning. He actually got worse oh. over the week. And then it was like almost 90 days uh, that, you know, I followed him up. It was maybe a little bit shorter, but 
he was nearly resolved. So it's kind of a cool one that we can plug in. I got some good video of it on my cell phone, uh, kind of watching it over the course of uh, three months, watching it really, watching it really go bad up and in on that right side, that eye going up and in, and then slowly kind of not going as much up and in to almost resolved. I probably should put the video of the patient with the with the herpetic scarring and a fourth nerve palsy, where she was act she actually had a her good eye had a had twenty eighty vision, so she fixated with her her paretic eye and it really kind of threw the uh, you can actually you can actually see her eye dripped up uh, dripped out of the way, or or, or actually dropped down. Now, I think there's anything else I wanted to say about uh, about these palsies. Okay. All right. 84-year-old African-American man with a history of glaucoma presents for consultation and care. Looking at his past records, he had been diagnosed the previous year with dry, age-related macular degeneration in the right eye and wet AMD. Oh, sorry. I remember what I was going to say about the fourth nerve palsy. Yeah, don't grind prism in for a long time. <laughs> Wait no less than six months. Use Fresnel prism or or patches. You know, if you grind prism in too early, you'll you'll end up eating the glasses. Okay, so back to this case. Eighty-four year old uh, African American Joe, male. If you're, if you're going to make that comment, let me just make the comment. If it's ischemic, um, the Fresnel will probably change. It will probably help them, but they'll probably just take it off over time. Uh, exactly. So. The, the ischemic maybe just kind of have them tilt their head or just kind of work through it over those 90 days because it just resolves so quickly that as you measure them um it just you just can't replace them quick enough 84 year old african-american male glaucoma presents for a consultation and care past records he had been diagnosed amd dry amd in the right eye and wet amd in the left with a circinate ring of exudates temporal to the macula uh, he never followed through the retinal consultation for AMD. I'm going to have you look at this, and we're going to come back. I'm going to let you take a look at everything there. You know, there's his uh, left eye, and there's a macular ring of exudates. And we have this eye here. There's a number of things to look at. And that's going to bring me to polling question number eight. And Greg, I know you recognize this place. This is one of the oldest buildings in North America. It's in Quebec City. And this is when I visited in the winter. So I'm going to go back. How many things do you see wrong here? One, two, three, four, five, six, or seven things wrong. How many things are wrong in this patient? I'm going to let you go back and take a look at that. So look, total everything up in both eyes. This is going to probably be a slow one, Greg. So with that said, I'll check out the uh, chat. We're all caught up there. What I haven't done, Joe, is I haven't launched the handout. So I'm going to oh, see okay. if I See if I can go in and do that. All right, this is this is going to be a tough one. So I'm not going to string it out too long. I'm going to end the poll. I'm going to share the results. Nobody picked one or two, three, four people picked five. Some six and some seven. All right, Greg, tell me when you've launched the poll. Or I've launched, I'm sorry, I launched the uh, handout. Because I'm going to need you to keep score for me. Okay, so. All right, let's I just got it. Okay, let's keep score. All right, we've got a clear view of the fundus. Not a clear view of the fundus here. What do you think all these things are? Asteroid hyalosis. Okay, there's one. Two, he's got collateral vessels. Collateral vessels usually occur as a result of a vascular occlusion. So there's two. He has got a ring of exudates here. He has got three. He has got an accumulation of hemorrhage. He's got a retinal vascular occlusion in this eye. Four, he has glaucomatous cupping in each eye. 
five. Am I missing anything here, Greg? I have at least five things. I thought it was more or closer to eight. He has also got drusen throughout the fundus in the, in the macular region. So we're going to call that maybe six. Am I missing anything, Greg? Do you say anything that I might have missed? Yeah, I mean, we can comment on the vessels. I mean, the vessels certainly aren't the healthiest vessels. Uh, uh, the, the arterial venous side is not the, is not the healthiest. Okay. That brings me to question, polling question number nine. Give me a second to stop. Mm -hmm. Let me switch over to number nine. Here it comes. Does this patient have wet AMD? Yes or no? And also be, be aware of his, uh, of his race. And this, Greg, is Quebec City in the winter. I went there for Christmas one year. You know, maybe one thing we should put in the chat is, because we're having trouble finding time to get back to Quebec City for our live meeting, would you go for a winter meeting? Maybe early December. It is lovely there. That's coming from a guy that lives in Florida. Keep that in mind. Yeah, I, don't, I don't see the white stuff very often. Do you have to wear socks there, Joe? Oh, yes. In winter, we, 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 I have to wear socks to work in Florida. So does the patient have wet AMD? Yes or no, or maybe I'm not really sure. Okay, I'm going to end oh. the poll. All right. I'll share it. Greg, what are your thoughts about AMD uh, in a person of color? Yeah, it's it's uh, it can happen. It's not un it's not unheard of, but it's going to be pretty rare. So, so we have to yeah you know, we have to consider that. And uh, let, me, let me go let me go on back here a little bit and we take a look at some things here. Yeah, she he was diagnosed with having a macular ring of exudates, and apparently it is still there a year later. As I saw the patient. And when you have that degree of, uh, of exudation or, or if you have a choroidal neovascular membrane over the course of a year, I expect to see probably some discoform scarring. I don't expect to see activity. And what I want to point out within, is in the dead center here in this small round lesion. When you see a ring of exudate, look in the center because you're actually dealing not with macular degeneration. He does not have dry. He has drusen, but his maculas were not uh, atrophic. This is not uh, this is not AMD. This is not a cortical neovascular membrane. That is a retinal macroaneurysm. So a lot of things didn't fit. So his race didn't fit. The persistence of this leakage didn't fit. We have to consider other causes, but obviously his, you know, obviously not a very healthy person. So he actually had a retinal arterial macroaneurysm. I mean, we need to look for these saccular dilatations. If you have a circinate retinopathy, that's always a consideration, particularly if that's not part of diabetes, but it is the main feature of the retinopathy that you're seeing is this, this, this circinate uh, ring of exudates. Look in the center, run your OCT, angiography, you're going to see that saccular dilatation. You know, this is, uh, you know, people in the, in the 50 to 80 uh, year range. It is really part and parcel, very, very common patients who are, who are hypertensive. Now, asymptomatic non-leakening retinal uh, macroaneurysms can be monitored periodically. If there's leakage and it's not threatening the macula, they can be still monitored. I've monitored some of these patients where the leakage did not affect the, uh, the macula. And sometimes it may take months before it, uh, it will involute. Now, if it is threatening the macula, involving the macula, there's macular edema. Uh, photocoagulation can speed resolution of the lesion and uh, bevacizumab, uh, ranibizumab, uh, ILEA, these are all things that can be, be enhanced. Greg, any thoughts here? I do not, Joe. I'm going to be chatting with a person here that's having some trouble getting back in. So all right. I'll take care of that. So no worries. All right. So we're going to go on to case number nine. I'm thinking... 
you know, I actually would really rather go. I'm going to jump ahead because we're we're coming to the end. I'm going to be we're going to be very cognizant of your time uh, on a Sunday evening. Case number ten. I think this may be our last one. She's a 78 year old female who has a sudden onset of ptosis in her left eye, and it happened immediately following parathyroid surgery. Now, let me explain to you what actually, how this all happened. It was on a Thursday and she had uh, parathyroid surgery on uh, Thursday. You can see that she has uh, the wound right there. And they removed three parathyroid adenomas. Now, when she was driven home from the hospital by her by her son, uh, he noticed that her eyelid was drooping. She was kind of out of it after anesthesia, so they never really paid attention. Now, she woke up the next day, and she has this droopy eyelid, and she called her surgeon, who, according to her, was very panicky and sent her to the emergency room because he said, you're probably having a stroke. So she goes to the emergency room where they perform a non-contrast enhanced CT of the head because that's what they do. And there's no intracranial bleeding, and they did not admit her. They said she's not having a stroke. Now, she did have headache and eye pain. She came in to see me. This is Friday, and it was around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We can see she has a, a ptosis and a meiosis. She has just had... Uh, neck surgery and when i put her in a dark room her pupil does eventually uh, enlarge slowly i used iopidine apriclonidine to uh, put in her in her eye and actually raised her lid and helped open her pupil a little bit and that's pretty uh pretty diagnostic of a, of a horner syndrome now what is a horner syndrome it is a triad it's not to try sometimes it's a biad uh, from disruption of the of the sympathetic innervation to the eye and the face causing meiosis, ptosis of the upper and lower lid, and anhydrosis. Now, in these patients, uh, they sometimes will have a revert a lower lid ptosis where the lower lid is actually a little bit higher and uh, uh, covering the cornea. So it doesn't have to be everything. You know, sometimes there may be a ptosis and a meiosis. Sometimes there may be only one finding. So don't think it has to be everything. So I diagnosed her with a Horner syndrome. It brings me to question number 11. And this is uh, Rue de Petit Champlain in winter in Quebec City. It was cold. Now, what's the most likely diagnosis or cause? Is it lung cancer? Is it carotid dissection? Is it direct surgical trauma to the nerve? Is it migraine? Or I don't know. That's why I'm here. And I think we'll be wrapping up with this last case here, Greg. That sounds good. There was a person that was... Uh in the uh in the in the in the meeting they just wanted to still get credit but i got them back in so we're good you're great all right this one seems a little bit easier people are rolling in and i think we can probably at this point end the poll share share the results <laughs> And most people say direct surgical trauma to the nerve. Some people say lung cancer, carotid dissection. And it makes all the sense in the world. Uh, surgical trauma to the oculosympathetic plexus is, you know, it, it goes together like, like, you know, cookies and cream. Uh, she's had neck surgery. It makes all the sense in the world. What bothers me is she has headache and eye pain. Now, she is still recovering from surgery the day before, and she's kind of quite not herself. She's not feeling very, you know, still not feeling very well. But I don't like the headache and eye pain. That shouldn't be occurring as part and parcel of neck surgery. She feels, still feels that she is recovering from the anesthesia. I discussed the uh, issue of the Horner syndrome. We diagnosed it. I made a recommendation that, you know, there's a possibility that all this together might be pointing toward a carotid dissection. 
And I said, we need to get imaging. I think you should go back to the emergency room, to which she said, absolutely not. Now, she was actually a retired nurse. She had some, uh, she had some medical insight. He said, I was just there this morning. I, they told me I'm fine. And I said, well, they actually did a CT. I had the, I had the report. They did a non-contrast CT of her head. Uh, if you're looking for a carotid dissection, you need to do a CTA or MRA of the neck. And the image was not done. She refused to, uh, to consider it. Then, of course, she, uh, you know, she drops the bomb. She says to me, well, you're, you're, you're an optometrist. And she may have said, you're just an optometrist. I, I'm not really sure. And she said, what about, you know, can I see one of your ophthalmologists? I said, well, there's none of our ophthalmologists are here. And uh, if you did, they would do the same thing. She said, well, what about a neuro-ophthalmologist? Can I see a neuro-ophthalmologist? And I said, absolutely, you can. She said, can I see a neuro-ophthalmologist now? I said, no. She said, why? She said, it's 4.40 on a Friday. I'm the best you're going to get. You're not going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to help you. You're not going to be able to walk into uh, any clinic and see a neuro-ophthalmologist uh, walk in at 4.40 on a Friday. She refused to uh, follow any of my uh, admonitions, but I did convince her to uh, take some low-dose aspirin. Well, I called her the next day, and she was feeling better, but she still had headache and eye pain, which kind of bothered me. And that was a Saturday, and I called her on Sunday. And on Sunday, she was feeling much better, though she still had some chronic headache, and I still don't like this. So Monday, because she's a snow, she's a snowbird and she lives in Buffalo part of the year and South Florida the other part of the year. She called her ophthalmologist and described everything. And you know, apparently he listened and he said, Look, I can't order any imaging from here. Either you have to go back and listen to what he says and do what he wants you to do, or leave him alone. Don't bother him if you're not going to do it which I thought was a, a rather stand-up thing to do. So by Tuesday, she was agreeable to get some imaging. I did not send to the ER at that point. I actually ordered the imaging myself, a CT, uh, CT angiogram, which showed a small carotid dissection. At that point, we increased her aspirin to full strength. And based upon positive imaging, I was able to get her into stroke neurology the next day. Now, anything can happen in this three-neuron arc, but what we have to be aware of and consider is carotid dissection. This is a third-order lesion, a acute onset corner syndrome that can cause head pain, eye pain, neck pain, facial pain. It's painful, right? Bottom line, it's painful. You know, the carotid artery and the active sympathetic plexus in the neck travel together. The sympathetic plexus travels with the carotid. So anything happens to the carotid there, it's going to affect the uh, affect the, the active sympathetic plexus. Carotid dissection is a linear tear in the vessel wall. It leads to thrombus, and thrombus leads to embolus, and embolus can lead to stroke. And that's why these patients are at risk. They're at strong risk for cerebral vascular accident. Now, it can happen after surgical trauma, whiplash, car accident, uh, chiropractic massage, or it can happen spontaneously. You, I mean, they do happen spontaneously. So new onset painful corners should be considered an emergency. Now, 52% of these patients will have a hemisphere, hemispheric stroke within six days. Two-thirds within a week, 90% within two weeks. After 31 days, the vessel wall has, has healed, it's repaired itself, they're out of the risk. So patients who have a hornus from a suspected carotid dissection should go right to the emergency room and tell them what to look for. This was a very small dissection, but it was very, I, I told them what to look for, where to look for, and they were able to find it. And the positive imaging got, me, got her into stroke neurology the next day. So they don't need neurosurgery, they don't need vascular surgery, they need supportive, supportive help and stroke prevention, which is why I'm very glad she, she, I did advocate and she listened and she took low dose aspirin, we got into a high dose aspirin and she actually did uh, very well. Her, you know, her and her ophthalmologist have offered to take me to a Buffalo Bills game if I want to come up. 
its self. I want to be very, very, very cognizant of everybody's uh, everybody's time. So, with that, Greg, are there any chats I should I should be uh, I should be aware of in here? Uh, looking here, a couple direct messages. Nothing's in the chat. Okay. Well, very good. So, with that. So my comment on the carotid dissection here and these Horner syndrome is, you know, when I went to school in PCO, you know, I thought I was going to be seeing these pancoast tumor type of patients every time I saw a carotid dissection. In my 27 years of practicing in the area, I think I've seen one and really um, they've all kind of turned out to be carotid dissection. So my point would be to the, to the audience here, you know, when you see these Horner syndromes come in, uh, you know, kind of think, you know, carotid dissection, that's kind of where they've been in, in my book. I'm not sure what they follow in your book. And then my final comment would be, you mentioned using iopidine <clears throat> and a lot of people will go, well, iopidine and, and alpha-GAN, but they're two different type of receptors. So if you're going to try and reverse this with uh, like an alpha-GAN type of product, that doesn't work as well. Uh, when you're talking with the alpha agonist, make sure that you try and use uh, iopidine. Yeah. And interestingly enough, I happen to these patients with Horner syndrome actually really, they, they really enjoy it. I end up prescribing it probably once or twice a day and they do very well. It, it, it helps uh, lift their lid and their pupil and they're very happy with it. So with that, Greg, let's just wrap this up and, uh, and go on home.